Welcome back to the Neuroscience Meet Social and Emotional Learning Podcast, episode number 121, with the former PE teacher from Naperville, Illinois, Paul Zentarski. Hello and welcome back. I'm Andrea Samadhi, a former educator who's been fascinated with learning the science behind high performance strategies in school sports and the workplace for the past 20 years. If you've been listening to our podcast for some time, you'll know that we've uncovered that if we want to improve our social and emotional skills and experience success in our work and personal lives, it all begins with putting our brain health first. We've mentioned that exercise is one of the top five health staples that's a known brain health and Alzheimer's prevention strategy from our episode 87, helping us to take our results, productivity, and health to these higher levels. Ever since I came across John J. Rady's book, Spark, I've been drawn in wanting to learn more so I can share his research with you with the hopes that something he's uncovered inspires you like it inspired me and that together we can make improvements, even small ones in our lives that lean us closer towards the health and wellness that we all need these days. Today, I am so excited to introduce you to Paul Zentarski. He's the former physical education coordinator from Naperville Central High School, as well as the football coach, who worked closely with Phil Lawler to attain the profound results to put Naperville on the map for outstanding academic achievement with their zero-hour PE program. John Brady described Paul Zentarski and Spark as a gray-haired furnace of a man with steady eyes and a fact is fact delivery with the presence of Mike Ditka and Bill Parcells rolled into one figure of authority. This paints the picture of one tough coach with high expectations and no room for messing around. I've worked with a couple of PE teachers who had this same reputation in the toughest schools in the West End of Toronto, and I found that there's always a softer side to this tough exterior, and I felt this when I watched Mr. Zentarski's TED Talk. You can see for yourself or go to his website where you'll learn more about his Learning Readiness PE program that reveals the passion he has for his students to learn and be healthy at the same time. What excites me the most as I'm preparing my interview questions for the coach they call Mr. Z is that not only did he have the vision for what he expected of his team, school, and players, but he had the vision of the smart jock back then before everyone was talking about the importance of neuroscience in the classroom. Dr. Rady recalled saying that when he first met Mr. Z, he was shocked that he heard coaches saying things he never expected coaches to be saying. He quoted Mr. Z saying, in our department, we create the brain cells and it's up to the other teachers to fill them with regards to their academics. I've thought long and hard about the questions I want to ask Paul Zentarski, whose presence has been described as that of a seasoned U-boat commander, with the hopes that something he says lights a spark for the listener to do something, take some action, use the immense wisdom that's transformed Naperville's well-oiled PE program. Let's hear from Mr. Z. Welcome, Paul Zentarski. What an honor to have this opportunity to speak with you today. And thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. What part of the country have we reached you in today? I see there's some sunshine coming in the window. You're reaching me in the Midwest. We're in Illinois, still in Naperville, the city I've spent, oh gosh, my last 40 years in. So yeah, it's, uh, it's a bright sunny day, but we have rain coming. Thank you so much for being here today. It's uh, I would welcome rain where I am. I'm in Arizona and it's going to be 90 degrees today. And I didn't get my morning run in this morning, so I'm going to have to do it in the in the heat. There you go. Well, thank you for having me. I'm I'm delighted to be part of your podcast. Thanks so much. Well, you know, can we go back if you could, if you could take us back because I covered John Brady and he really 
drew so much interest with what you guys did over at Naperville. Could you just go back and, you know, I was sorry to read about Phil Lawler, who worked hand in hand with you, how he lost his battle with cancer. But, you know, he came to you with this idea for this new PE program. And Dr. Brady explained that it took the longest time to convince you. So do you remember when he came to you? What did he say that made you want to give this new PE thing a shot? Well, uh, I really got into phys ed because I wanted to make a difference in the life of kids. And we looked around and we didn't think we were doing that. Um, People were dropping phys ed programs all over the country and and still are, as a matter of fact. So obviously what we were doing wasn't working. So we had to reinvent ourselves. We didn't, one, we didn't want to lose jobs. That's, you know, my livelihood. We had family to support, Mm -hmm. but it didn't make sense. And I had uh, two children who were not athletically inclined. I mean, they just weren't. So I knew that the sports model of physical education just wasn't the answer. We just needed to look beyond what we were doing in terms of the sports model. And uh, so we started to make changes gradually. Probably one of the big changes early on that Phil introduced was when we played sports, uh, we still did it because it was part of our program, but we played it in what we call small-sided games so that everybody needed to be involved. A perfect example would be soccer. You use small goals with no goalkeepers. And then you put a small cone in the the middle of the field. And so your four on four players all have to be on the offensive side of of the field before they can score. So you're not what we have, what we call cherry picking. You're not having somebody stand at one side and waiting for a long pass to come their direction. So, you know, different changes like that, three on three in basketball, four on four in volleyball. And it just, it made a difference. It got kids more active. Uh, we looked at what we were doing time-wise in our classrooms, and we were spending too much time in organization and not enough time in activity. Definitely. And, and I mentioned to you, I'm a former PE teacher. So I remember definitely the difference between the times I was in a PE class with the boys, they were always involved in drills. I could keep them moving, but then you get the girls PE and they're in little circles talking. So the downtime, it was really difficult to motivate them. It was way easier for the boys, but did you notice that too? Was that something that you saw? Absolutely. And more importantly too, is we eliminated a lot of the skill stuff. So for example, Passing a ball back and forth in soccer is a meaningless activity. I coached soccer for 40 years. So when we would practice, we would practice two against two, one against one, four against four in a smaller area. Uh, the kids had more touches. They learned to be more skillful. They learned to control the ball under pressure, things like that. So we didn't spend time in skill development. It was being developed during our playtime where kids were just more active. Got it. Got it. And then, Paul, as the movement grew and the media attention caught hold of what you were building at Naperville, so Newsweek got a hold of it, and then you appeared on Morgan Spurlock's Super Size Me documentary. So how did you make the connection between what you were doing, the results you were creating, and the brain to bring in neuroscience to this? Well, I really have to credit Dr. Rady for that. Um, he saw, and it was Phil Lawler who was in uh, Super Size Me. Okay. And Phil Lawler had heard Dr. Rady on public radio say, exercise like fertilizer brain is so good, it's like miracle grow. Well, in Super Size Me, Phil used that quote. Well, Dr. Rady's daughter sees the movie Super Size Me and says, Dad, this PE teacher in Naperville is using one of your quotes. So being a researcher, he looks into our program, found out that we had daily PE at the high school level and the junior high level, two days a week, unfortunately, at the elementary level because of space and and limitations in in facilities. And he said, wait, he looked at our graduation rates. He looked at our obesity rates and he said, I've got to come and see your program. So we pick him up, we take him to the hotel, we drop him off. And of course, we're sitting down having grape juice at the bar. And... um, the first thing he ta- starts talking to me about or talking to Phil and I about was BDNF. 
brain-derived neurotrophic factor. He says, every time you do aerobic exercise, you create new brain cells. And I jumped out of my seat. I said, what? Why don't you tell administrators this? They're dropping phys ed programs all over the country. And he looked at me and he said, well, we just thought that they knew it. Well, if you're in education, you know that nobody takes a class in neuroscience. We have administrators and school board members making decisions without understanding how the brain functions. And so it started me on a journey. And, and so learning from Dr. Rady, uh, learning from a, a, a professor here at the University of Illinois at the time, he's now moved to the East Coast. His name is, doc, is Dr. Chuck Hillman. And what he was doing at the time at the University of Illinois, he was doing MRI scans on students. And, and what he found is that students' brains were more active taking a test after merely date doing a 20 minute walk. So they, took, they sat down, they took the test, they took a 20 minute walk, took the same test and their brain scans just were vibrant colors. I mean, it was just lit up. So that really got me excited. He, he took the study, went a little bit further. He separated the kids into two groups, higher fit students and lower fit students. And the criteria wasn't very hard. If you were an eight or nine year old and you could run a quarter mile without stopping, you were a high fit student. If you had to stop and rest, you were a low fit student. I mean, really a very low standard if you ask me. Anyway, then he put them through, and again, the tests were not cognitive tests. They're uh, flanker and switch tests. Uh, if you're familiar with something like lumosity, there's a red square. The next thing you see is either a red square or a different shape or whatever, and, and you react. And, the, and again, the higher fit students, their brains just lit up when they were taking the test as opposed to the lower fit students. When they got down to the harder test, their brains were all red. It was just all lit up and the lower fit students still couldn't recruit enough brain power to do well on the test. So, I mean, just amazing things. Right. Took it one step further and he called it a, a fit kids program. And what he did is, again, he got 221 kids from the, from the university area and, brought, and divided them in half. And half of them came in every day. There was a school day and they were trained for one hour, like so one extra hour PE class and did all kinds of different activities, indoor soccer, basketball, pogo stick, rope jumping, running, hurdling, you name it, anything they could do. And they were being taught by um, future phys ed teachers, these are students who were taking, taking classes in phys ed. So one hour. And the other group was put on a wait list. And they had, and in Illinois, generally at the elementary schools, about two, sometimes three days a week of, of phys ed. So these, just, these kids just had an extra hour PE. Well, again, when he contrasted the MRI images of brain development between the kids who had the one extra hour PE as opposed to those kids who didn't have benefit of the one hour, the, it, it's dramatic. I mean, it's irrefutable. It's science. It's not voodoo. It's, it's like eye-opening. And then I wish every administrator in the world <laughs> would understand this, but they don't. Oh, when you said that you caught the neuroscience bug when you heard Dr. Rady talking about the BDNF. That's what lit up for me when he mentioned it. Forget about the whole part that it is there when we're exercising. We should all know what this is for our future to prevent, to stay healthy, educators, administrators. So this whole neuroscience piece, I think is, is brilliant what you brought in. And I just wonder, so I know that you saw the scans and it was obvious, but did you have any sort of pushback? If you talked in the hallway to other teachers and you're saying, oh, look what we're, and, and I'm sure it wasn't as obvious back then. So you're kind of spearheading the way with something new. Did anyone say what? <laughs> Absolutely. Not only did my, uh, did my fellow, and I, I was a department chairman. So not only did my fellow department chairman have a pushback, but my administration had a pushback. And my, my current P, my PE teachers at the time, because again, nobody had ever heard of us. Mm -hmm. And what had happened was we, had a, we have daily physical education at Naperville Central High School, okay? Our kids take seven semesters of PE 
one semester of health. That's a graduation requirement. So what we did is one time we had a data retreat. And so we mined data. We had counselors, department chairmen, uh, central office personnel, board members, you, you name it. And anybody who calls mining data a retreat is nuts. It's, it's <laughs> work. So when we, when we looked at the data, what we said, what can we say about our kids who are struggling in school? And the most common denominator is they were our poor readers. So our administration in their infinite wisdom went back to the English department and said, okay, we need to create an intervention program for our poor readers. So they created a class called literacy. Well, they ran the class. They put just about 16 kids in the class the first year and they found success with it. Now, Unfortunately, we had some parents who complained that the, they had their kids in that class because as freshmen then, they didn't get to take an elective. We have an eight period program. So our students take their five core subjects. They have a period of lunch, they have PE, and then they have an elective. Well, this literacy class took their elective. Freshman parents don't understand that by the time a student gets to be their senior year, they've had more than enough electives, but freshman parents, you know, they're worried, oh, and so my principal comes to me and says, all right, would you consider running a zero hour PE for those kids who are in the literacy class? Well, I had talked to Dr. Rady. Absolutely. But I have one caveat that after that first hour, after that zero hour PE, then those kids have to have a literacy class. He said, OK, we'll schedule it that way. Went to the English teachers or the reading teachers. I said, we need to collect data because they didn't collect any data the first year. They thought, well, you know, the program we created was wonderful. It was good. I'm not going to say anything bad about English teachers now, but they're, they're in a world of their own, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And uh, that'll get me in trouble. Anyway, uh, so we they have what was called a, a nationwide test. It's called the Nelson Denning test. And there's a portion A and a portion B. They can measure growth from point A to point B. So I said, let's test them at the beginning of the semester. Let's test them at the end of the semester. And if we don't see any growth or any difference, then I'll go back to the neuroscientists and find out what, what it is we need to tweak. Well, of the, of the 16 kids in the literacy class, seven of them, or nine of them, I'm sorry, uh, nine of them decided that they would join uh, the zero hour PE. Seven of them got off the bus and went to first period class. When we looked at the data afterwards, the kids who had the PE class before and grew a half a year more in reading scores than the kids who just got off the bus. Wow. So now my administration said, wow, this is significant. So now the next year, every kid who had a literacy class was put into what we then called learning readiness PE. Second year after seeing the results, the, the, the department chairman saw the results and, and my math department chairman, he was, He's just a great guy who, again, cares about kids and says, I want in on this. I said, well, do you have a, a class that's like literacy? And he said, yes, we do. We have a class that's called Intro to Algebra. These are kids who at ninth graders aren't ready to take algebra, so they go into intro. I said, okay. So I had two sections of learning readiness PE going on. He tried to finagle kids. He did his own scheduling and put some kids in. LRPE before, and, what, and when we looked again at the data, he had what was called an algebra ready test. The difference was about 90% better improvement with those kids who had PE before. Wow. So, and over, over the years that we kept the data, it's, it's proven out, you know, it, tended, it ended up being 93% in math, and, and it was the final year we, when I retired, I came back and said, look, we need to do this over the whole year for the reading. And so the kids who had PE before improved almost three years of, of reading improvement in a full, full nine-month period. And the kids who didn't have PE improved like one year. So, I mean, the data held out all the way through. It was just, it was remarkable. That is an really opening. Wow. And then you're talking about this, what you called learning readiness PE. So 
then this whole movement came where PE was getting cut. And I remember it back in the day. How did you keep your vision going to keep learning readiness PE? And I know that that's your website, right? That's what your program was. Can you talk a little bit about what you developed and how did you kind of save PE? Well, you have to understand that in, in Illinois, PE is, is still a state requirement. So we weren't, we weren't losing piece per se in Illinois, but some school districts were, were seeking waivers and they were looking, say, if a student was an athlete, they could wave out a PE. If a student was in marching band, they could wave out a PE. So they, we had school districts that were doing this. So, but in, in Naperville, you know, we didn't allow, the, we didn't allow those waivers as, as much as other school districts did. We made it difficult for students to really wave out. And then of course, every time we would have the, that opening uh, session with the parents, uh, where most PE teachers, uh, and I saw this from a professor from down at Illinois State University, they talk, PE teachers talk about socks, jocks, and locks. You know, you got to have a uniform, you got to have a locker, you got to, you know. And we wouldn't, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't talk about that. What I would do is I would tell the parents when they would come and see us in the gym, I was I would send them I would send them all in the bleachers and I would talk to them all myself. I said, we are creating new brain cells every time your students do an exercise. And I showed them the brain scans of Dr. Hillman. And and what happened was we got them buy-in from the parents. They said, Oh, I see. Well, you know, even though my son is an athlete, I think that break in the day or PE is good for them. So a lot of them didn't wave out it when they, especially when they saw the results from learning readiness PE. As a matter of fact, we got to the point where we had juniors and seniors that would go to their counselor and say, you know, I have advanced, whatever, advanced placement history or something, third period, can I get PE either first or second period? And they started to advocate for themselves as a result of the information we were sharing with our students and our parents. This is phenomenal to, to hear. I get chills as you're talking because this is just so powerful. And what drew me in when I was reading Spark was your vision for the smart jock. And this was years before it's in to be smart. And I hear researchers talking about it all the time now, how it's those kids that take care of their brain health, their nutrition, that go on to skyrocket and have like uh, discover incredible things. It's the, you know, those smart kids that might not have been cool in school back in the day, but you are creating the smart jock. So what did you notice and, and how did you notice this need to recognize and reinforce this new stereotype? Well, over my 40 years of teaching, uh, I've coached 75 sports seasons. So yeah, I was a football coach for a while, nine years, soccer for 20 years, track for 40 years. But I also spent about seven years coaching cross country. And so it was amazing. The cross country runners, if you look, if you look at grade point averages and honor rolls and whatnot, it's really dominated by, by cross country runners. Yeah. And so obviously when I started to hear about building brain cells. Then the connection was made. Hey, these kids are smart for a reason. One, they have more brain cells. They work hard. Uh, they're, a, they're a dedicated athletic type person because just going out running distances is hard. And um, it, it, the connection was just there. It just said, okay. And then you'd look, again, I was just looking at my soccer players who was a very again cardiovascular activity and yeah smart jocks are our thing you can't you can't be a good athlete and be dumb it, it, it just it doesn't sit and so the stereotype of a dumb jock just it's not there anymore love that love that so what exactly was zero hour PE? What did it entail? And, and I read some parts where you had those heart rate monitors that I know back in the day we all wore them, but now you can measure with a Fitbit or a watch. But can you explain how you measured them? What was it? How did, how did you get these incredible results? 
Well, again, based on the neuroscience and, and knowing that cardiovascular conditioning was a big factor in building new brain cells. And then when you follow that up with new learning, then if you're taking those new brain cells you just created and you're enhancing them. So what we did is our zero hour or learning readiness PE classes involved cardiovascular conditioning three days a week. Now, an athlete can't, you know, anybody can't work hard three days a week. Our normal heart rate monitors for our average students were set at 145 to 185 beats per minute. For our learning readiness PE kids, we set them at 155 to 200. Now, 200 is in what we call the anaerobic stage. That's that, you know, you're out of breath, you can't maintain it. But what we wanted our kids to do in our learning readiness PE class is to get a minimum of 20 minutes in what we call their training heart rate zone. That was at 155 to 200. Well, if they got above 185 because they were doing something hard, we didn't want to punish them. But at the same time, we wanted them to tweak it up. We wanted them to kick it up to 155, which is not that difficult, but it's just a little bit better expectation. We said, and I'll never forget, uh, and I got a million stories, obviously. So if I get if I get carried away, you can stop me. No, this is forget, I had a, a student come in who was scheduled to be who was scheduled to be in learning readiness PE, and he was a soccer player. And he says, I'm an elite soccer player. And being a soccer coach, I just just shook my head. He says, I'm not going to be in the dumb jock or, or in the dumb PE class. I says. Dumb PE class, you're going to work harder in this class than you would in a normal PE class. Mom came in because she wanted to defend his son. And when I showed her the results, she looked at him and said, you're going to be in this learning rate in this PE class, whether you like it or not. He goes wow. on to be, he's now teaching PE, by the way. Holy moly. And he's not the only one. We've had a young lady who also, after being in the learning rate in PE class, is now teaching phys ed because, again, they found the value that exercise was bringing to their brains and, and to their lives in general. Anyway, so the learning readiness PE, again, three days a week was involved with cardiovascular. Now, again, you can't work hard. So you have to have some fun days too. Again, if we're playing small sided games, they're very active, but we did a lot of team building activities in the beginning. That's putting kids through some kind of a challenge that they had problem solve working with their teammates because we wanted them to become a team in their class so they would encourage each other to work hard on those days that you know that they may struggle. And so team building activities was a big part of it. Uh, gymnastics, uh, tumbling, that was a big part of the class because the cerebellum, a small part below behind the brain. Uh, covers coordination and balance in the brain, but it also co covers coordination and balance in the body. So we found, again, working with neuroscientists, that that was an important element that a lot of times is, is neglected, especially at the high school level. Yep. So gymnastics and balance and those kinds of things were put into it. We did some weight training, but and, and some just fun activities that, that kids enjoy doing. Um, it was It was important. So when I was reading Spark, there was a whole bunch of stories that caught my attention. And one of them was a student that had learned the, these skills in the learning readiness PE and went on to college and the skills stuck. And she was studying for college and was stressed out and used these skills, becoming a lifelong exerciser. She went and ran up and down the stairs in her dorm room. What was it that that caught them and made them be lifelong exercisers? <laughs> They're human beings with a thinking brain. They saw that it, they saw that it worked. Mm -hmm. They knew how it helped them prepare for school, how, how it helped them study, how how it helped them de-stress. De, de All of those things. I mean, it was just they lived it, they experienced it. So they said, "Hey, I you know I have to do this." And and again. The, the two that are now teaching PE, I, I mean, I love it. You know, I run into conferences, I run into them, and they just stop me in a hall. As a matter of fact, I'm really proud of this. Probably over the years, we had we had a very diverse PE program. We did we did activities nobody even thought about doing. And uh, I'll I'll find kids at conferences all the time that have graduated from Naperville Central High School that are now teaching PE. 
we probably graduated three to five kids every year in our senior class that went on and majored in PE in, in, in college because it was so diverse. But I, I warned them all. I said, you're not going to find another PE program like this one. You go to teach. And they came back and they said, you're right, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah, it's like magic what you guys created over there. What about, did you have any concerns with your students for pushing them too hard? Because I know you've got to have that fine line as a coach. And we all know that we can do a little bit more than we think we can do. You know, that's the trainer who tells us, you know, you can lift another five more. You definitely can. So did you have any concerns for liability reasons of pushing them and did it like, I know some of the parents, once you show them the results, but did anyone say this is too tough at all? Well, um, one, one of the things that heart rate monitors can tell you is they can tell you what we call an ambient heart rate. So when kids would come in and we would have them put their heart rate monitors on their straps in the, in the day, we would let them rest for a couple minutes. And if they had an unusually high ambient heart rate, in other words, kind of a resting heart rate for a kid is in the 70s to 80s. At that point in time, they've been running around school and whatnot. If they came in and their heart rate was at 100, we knew that they were in trouble because they were either ill, they were stressed, or they were close to injury. So heart rates taught us a lot about how to deal with kids. So we would back off if we, if we found that, you know, I started using that when I was training my track athletes too. There were times, you know, when I had a a plan practice and it come in and a lot of my athletes, you know, had unusually high ambient heart rates and said, okay, today needs to be a, a more gentle, kinder, kinder day. And so, you know, heart rates, the, the science, the technology is there and yet people still don't use it. It's, it's unbelievable. Like you say, I mean, I, I still wear a heart rate monitor when, when I work out and it, I, I can't believe that people still in this day and age work out without knowing what their heart rate is doing all the time. You're right. You're right. Well, let's hope that we open up some eyes today because this is really powerful. The fact that you created such a powerful program that increased these students' health and academics, it's just phenomenal. And a part that I loved, I have, of course, uh, mentioned to you when we first talked, but uh, I love how Dr. Rady compared you to Mike Ditka and Bill Parcells, two of the toughest head coaches in football history. With that being said, I know there's always a softer side to these tough coaches, but how did you know, you know, to, to push these kids more than their limit? Well, I guess just, just experience, you know, again, having coached 75 coaching seasons over the course of 40 years, you kind of know what kids can do and what they can't do. And uh, push, push back uh, again, uh, an elite soccer player, a female, uh, she was having trouble in, in a fitness class, getting her heart rate up. She says, I'm in too good a shape. I can't get my heart rate up in the 145 to 185 with his own. Her dad came in and says, she's an elite athlete and she's not getting an A and PE. I can't believe it. And I said, well, she's not, she's, she has to get 20 minutes in her training heart rate zone. And she's only getting five to 10 minutes in that. So she can't do it. She's too, she's too much of an elite athlete. I said, oh, really? I said, the next time you're in a fitness class, come and get me. And so we had in the, we had in a, a, a room set up with just all kinds of aerobic equipment, and she went to a treadmill. And the girl next to her was was a little bit on the heavy side, and she was kind of walking, jogging lightly, and she, she was she could see her heart rate. And I said, what, "What's your heart rate?" She said, "170." I said, "It's good." And this girl was struggling, and she she was running. She was kind of jogging. She said, "See, she's barely going, and I'm I'm running." I said, "Just a minute." I took that bed and I just elevated it about two or three degrees. And all of a sudden, her heart rate went up to 145. I said, yeah, you're an elite athlete. You're training. You have to learn to push yourself a little bit harder. You have been dogging it for a long time. You can do more than you think you can because you think you're an elite athlete and you haven't been doing yourself any any good. So it's a matter of, of you know, 
believe it or not, phys ed teachers are teachers. <laughs> and so we, so we teach them all of these concepts, or at least we should, ab about, about fitness, about heart rate, you know, about nutrition. Our, our, our jobs have evolved from beyond teaching just sports skills. And if not, it's sad. And that's why a lot of schools are still dropping PE because they don't see a value in it. That is a <laughs> eye opener because I've always had to push myself. Uh, when I'm on the hiking trails with my husband, he, his heart rate monitor and his, uh, his whatever he's burning is half what I'm doing. I'm walking beside him doing the same thing and I'm finished and it's saying you still need two more hours of exercise to get the same results, but you have to measure to know. Otherwise you're, like you said, dogging it. You're gi giving, like giving yourself way too easy and not pushing. So the, it, I think the key is to measure and know how hard you have to push your body really. Yeah. With, without a doubt. I've, I've had a lot of, I've had a lot of operations. I've had three hip replacements, a knee replacement and spine surgery. I'm afraid 40 years of teaching and athletics and, and whatnot has done me in. So for me anymore, my cardiovascular exercise is walking in our, in our community pool. And so again, I know that I can get my heart rate up when I just stay in the deep water. When I get into shallow water, my heart rate isn't as high. So I know that I have to stay with the water about shoulder height and whatnot. So we all need to learn it. And like you say, if you don't measure it, you don't know it. Yep. So it's yep. important. Well, what's your vision now? You're retired. You created this phenomenal legacy that I want everyone to know about, learn from. What's next? If, if, you know, what, where's your vision for this? I know you've got your learning readiness, PE.com program. If you go to that, your website, you can learn more about you there, but what, what's your vision for where this, where you'd like to see this going from here? Well, prior to COVID, <laughs> uh, I, you know, people would ask me to come and, and, uh, and train their phys ed teachers, um, train phys ed teachers in different parts of the country. And so I did that because again, unfortunately, a lot of the PE preparation programs don't get, in, don't get into this. Uh, toward, toward the end of my career, I was, I was starting to hire some that had a minor in PE, but a major in exercise fits because it was, it was, they needed to understand what, what needed to happen in, in classes. So take their exercise phys background and apply it to the, to the PE class. And so I'm trying to, if I could, trying to educate more, more phys ed teachers. But again, COVID has is, is kind of limited my, my travels, obviously. I'm, I'm, I'll never forget, I was doing a presentation in, in Lafayette, Louisiana, the last week of February. And I, and I arrived the day after Mardi Gras on that, on that Wednesday and uh, flew into New Orleans, flew out of New Orleans you know, on, the, on the following Thursday and whatnot. And then, they, then the world shut down. So, uh, and that was to, and what was nice is, and I've been doing this too, is that was to a community group. That wasn't to a school group. And again, it's important for parents and community members and decision makers to know and understand why this works and, and understand the neuroscience behind exercise. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming on the podcast today and sharing what you've built. It's a phenomenal legacy over there in Illinois. And if anyone wants to learn more and have you come in, do some work with them, is the best way learningreadinesspe.com. Is that the best place for them to go? That and and because then my email is uh, my email is there, and right now, with the situation and being retired, you know I respond to emails as quickly as possible. So, uh, you know I get emails from all over the world asking me about the program, asking me you know and asking me questions, and it, it's a lot easier for me to answer questions than it is to say this is the definitive way because every program can't be like Naperville Central's program. 
And so what you have to do is you have to take bits and pieces of the information that I give you and apply it to your program. And I can do that when you explain to me what your program is and then I can say, well, you need to tweak this, you need to tweak that, or you need to think about this. And, and of course, my first thing is you gotta get high rate mm -hmm. You got it. Well, thank you so much for your time today for sharing the legacy you've built, redefining PE, reinforcing the smart jock with our next generation's brain health in mind. It's been a true honor to have had this opportunity to speak with you. Thank you so much. Thank you for this opportunity, Andrea, and good luck. Get the word out to the whole world. You got it. Have an awesome day out there. Thank you. Bye.